Welcome back to Speak Out with Christine Jurgen. I want to give you guys a disclaimer before this episode starts um, and a warning that there are some very gruesome details shared in this podcast episode. It's There's some very tough stories to listen to, but I think they're very important for us to listen to. I want you to be in the right headspace when you're listening to it, though. And I want you to make sure there are no little kids around. I don't think they need to hear this. Teenagers are probably okay. I listened to it first, but I would allow my 15-year-old to to hear it um, and educate him on some of these things. But I want to make sure that you know what you're getting into. We're diving into sex trafficking and some of the gruesome things that are surrounding that industry. We're talking to um, Victor Marks today, who is, I say this in the episode, one of the most fascinating people I have ever had the opportunity to speak to uh, or listen to their story. Honestly, quite possibly the most fascinating man. Um, Him and his wife have an organization called All Things Are Possible, and they are working to help eradicate human trafficking and they're rescuing women and children and they're going into really dangerous places quite literally risking their lives in very very dangerous areas to rescue women putting putting their lives on the lines for people that they don't even know but this is their uh, life's passion this is the will of god for them they say and that they're going to continue to do it until they can't do it anymore and i'm so honored that we were able to have him on. Victor's story is a a beautiful one, but I want you to know there is some horrific, tough child abuse that happened in his, in his childhood that we do talk about. And, um, he, he had a a tough childhood, uh, I'd say even more than tough and he was abused in very gruesome ways. Um, eventually went into the military. His dad was not in his life. He eventually uh, reconnected with his dad at some point in time and found Jesus. And, you know, now he's doing everything that he's doing, but, um, sex trafficking is something that is not, selective, I guess you could say in the sense of it, it can affect anybody. It can affect anybody of any race, any gender, um, any socioeconomic status. We talk about that. There's people from, you know, really high influential positions to, you know, Joe, the plumber. And so I want you to really listen to this, see how you guys can get involved. Check out all things are possible, um, over at victormarks.com. And without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Victor Marks. Well, Victor, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us. I could probably interview you, I would assume, for probably like 10 hours. Uh, You are one of the most fascinating people, but you have uh, kind of a wild life. You've gone from, you know, trauma and child abuse that is absolutely horrific to rescuing people from the same. Mm -hmm. Give our audience a little bit of idea of who Victor Marks is. Yeah, I think for context for the audience, I... Uh, my, I was, uh, as a child, my father didn't claim me as his kid. He was a, a drug dealer and a, a pimp, actually, in his life. My mother um, married six times. I went to 14 different schools, lived in 70 different houses. Started drugs in the sixth grade, not to be cool. It's because I hurt, and I want to forget bad things that had happened to me. And I was sexually and physically abused from ages three to seven. And uh, at one point, I was left for dead in a commercial cooler. So it required 123 visits later in life to a trauma specialist uh, to try to get my mind working better and because I was very low functioning at a certain point due to post-traumatic stress. And um, you know what? It's, it's by the goodness of God that I can sit here. And you know, one of the things I always hear people say, they go, I would never imagine you being that kid. Yeah. And I would say, yeah, the one thing I never wanted to do is be a victim. Uh, but I know it sounds cliche, but, but but rather be a victor. And maybe that was God's way of making sure I got a name that I would hang on to for years through all my struggles. But, yeah, I went from surviving uh, to thriving. And that allows me to help others who are in need. And I thank God for him. Uh, for soul surgeons of the mind, because uh, I saw great counselors, and then for my bride of 35 years this year. I always love, I, I follow you on social media, and I love how you speak about your bride all the time, your wife. It's beautiful, and calling men to have these beautiful, flourishing marriages as well is so important, and you touch on fatherhood, but you something you just mentioned there, I kind of want to backtrack for a second you said that you were in a cooler, left yep. for dead. Yeah. How, 
how did someone find you? What happened? Yeah, it was the summer of 1970, and I was at my grandparents' house in Mendenhall, Mississippi, and I was playing um, in between two chicken farms, chicken houses, and uh, where there's you know thousands of chickens. Uh, but as a kid, you would just pray by yourself, and there was a neighbor uh, who, a neighbor young man who definitely had some mental issues and lived with his parents, but he was older. Um, and he found me playing, and he brought me into, it was a room, a little building where they would separate eggs and the chickens and all that. And he went to try to molest me, uh, which I'd, I had already been abused. This wasn't the first time, and I actually didn't want to be abused. And he he told me, if you ever tell anybody what I've tried to do, you know, I'll kill you. And I was yelling, I'm going to tell everybody. And so he grabbed me and opened the cooler door and shoved me in there and locked me in there, hoping I would die um, and then not be able to tell anybody. Uh, so I was in there for hours. We don't know really how long. I, I went unconscious. But when I didn't come home, um, after hours of being missing, my family started looking for me, my siblings and cousins. And, of course, they're saying, go find them. They looked in the woods. They looked down by a little pond. They thought maybe I drowned or got bit by a snake. And um, by this little chicken house, it was a corn cob with feathers in the back. It was a toy that I made, a little country toy where you put feathers in a chicken. Mm -hmm. uh, you throw it, and it whirly birds down. They knew that was mine. I'd made it, so they went into the building, and then they checked the cooler just to make sure that maybe I had played and got stuck and they opened the door and there I was, I was unconscious. So, um, you know, they just rushed me to the house, not even the hospital, brought me back to consciousness. And, um, you know, I, I thought I was in trouble, but I told them what had happened. And then they actually went and found the guy immediately kicked in his door and beat him in front of his parents. And then they tied him up and drug him behind a tractor behind my mamaw's house. And then up a pecan tree in the middle of the field, they threw a rope over, and they hung him. Uh, they didn't hang him to death. They hang him. They hung him till he was unconscious, and then they cut him down. So he did later die from complications of some stuff. Uh, none of it was laid at their feet. And um, so yeah, that that was um, a, a pretty heavy event in my life. Um, but I will say this to people who might be being triggered or just can't fathom that. The only thing I remember in the cooler, the five-year-old, was the sound of the fan blowing the cold air in, it being completely pitch black. But I remember a felt presence next to me, behind me on my left side, standing there. And it brought me such peace i can't i can't explain it yeah I, at first i was in terror anger to fear terror but then maybe when i was starting to fade i felt this presence and i had such a peace and i don't know to this day if it was an angel or maybe the lord visited me i don't know maybe an angel uh, but that that is what i do remember out of that incident i don't my jaw was literally open while you were sharing that story. I mean, my yeah. mouth is hanging open. I cannot imagine having to go through that. Or And this is literally just one thing that happened to you among a series of very many. Yeah. And now you have made it kind of your life's effort to go and help people who have had trauma, to people who have been victims of human, human trafficking. You're speaking out on that and trying to help eradicate human trafficking. Do you think that the trauma and abuse that you suffered as a child is what is, has kind of led you to take this path in life? I would say yes, but it was a long time getting here. And, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. I actually never talked about my past or my childhood till I was in my thirties. Wow. And, um, and you then, just bottled it all up. Yeah. Yeah. I just compartmentalized it. And then it was actually after 40 that I just realized I, I have to deal with all of this. It started affecting me and you know, trauma is like holding a beach ball underwater. 
you know, you, you, you keep it down because you don't want anybody to see it. But when, when a wave comes, it pops up and you're back on it. And it takes a lot of energy to keep past trauma it's a down. great analogy. Yeah. And then the Lord, he's, he just says, you can trust me. And, and, you know, I think it requires soul surgery because of wounds and, and stuff. And, and, and I'm every bit of a man that couldn't stand the thought of seeing a counselor or I remember one counselor I went to the first one, you know, my wife said, babe, you, you gotta go, you know, it's this stuff starting to come out. And, uh, you know, the hypervigilance, checking on my kids three times a night. Um, it, it wasn't if something bad is going to happen, but when. And it's torment. I was living in torment. But I remember she sent me this gal, this counselor. I was so I was so angry. I was like, ugh. <laughs> and, and this lady's like, you know, it's, this is a safe place. And I'm like, yeah, it's safe because I'm carrying a blade and a weapon. You know, right. that, everywhere I go is safe for me. And she's like, well, why don't you just share? And I'll never forget this poor gal. She's like, you know, tell me about your childhood. And I was aggravated, so I just kind of went, oh, you want to know? And I just, I told her like a handful of raw things, just machine gun, boom, 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 boom. With some of it, because I was tortured at a certain point, and some of it was pretty nasty. And uh, I look at her, she's just weeping. She's just crying, and I'm like, ma'am are you okay she's like uh oh, yeah and i actually gave her tissue that i guess was you supposed become to be counselor yeah i gave it to her i said hey i don't i think we're probably done for the day and she literally couldn't regroup herself professionally she and i i said hey thanks i appreciate this i went home i said don't ever send me to another dang counselor and uh you know we did try a male counselor later and, you know, he was a good old country boy, which was easier at the time, but I was still facetious and sarcastic. I mean, what does PhD stand for? Post hole digger? Mm. And he's like, uh, sure. But he asked me one question that haunted me for two years. One question. And it was almost like a scene out of a movie that starred Robin Williams as a psychiatrist and uh, Matt Damon. I think it was Matt Damon. And, um, but it was when he was talking to him about his abuse and he kept saying, don't, don't F with me. Don't mess with me because it, it triggered such raw emotions. And the question this doctor asked me, he said, Victor, you're a Christian so when you were being abused or tortured as a kid, where was the Lord? If God loves children, where was he when you were suffering? And I remember saying, hey, you know what? You don't have a right to ask that question because God is good. Jesus is perfect. And I'm sure he was helping other children who had a greater need than me. So don't you ask that question. And he kept pushing me. He's like, but where was he? Why don't you just ask him where was he? And I remember telling that man, dude, you're this close from getting punched. You need to let this go. And he says, well, one day you need to ask him. It took me two years. It took me two years to have the courage and the quietness to just say, Lord, where were you? And he showed me. It was the most profound things that happened to my life. And I hope what I'm about to share, because I don't like sharing it, you know, except I know it helps people. And it was, um, and if I get emotional, it's not because I feel bad for me or that I'm suffering any longer. It's because I am overwhelmed with the goodness of God in my life. To bring, to bring me from such hell that no one gave me a chance. Not the VA, not doctors. And that's why I get emotional because I made it. And not only made it, I mean, I've gone from thriving to, from surviving to thriving abundantly beyond what I could have ever imagined. I mean, I literally just, night before last, I just sat on the edge of my bed 
my wife next to me, and I just, I just was crying. And she touched my back. She said, babe, what's, what's wrong? I said, I can't believe my life turned out this good. I'm married. I got five children. I got five grandkids. I should have just never made it. But, you know, I remembered that time where my stepfather was beating me with a belt. And he would do it pretty sadistically. He'd lay you down on the bed in your underwear, and he'd, he'd open that belt up, and he'd hit you across your back, bottom legs. And and he'd wait. He'd wait for you because you tense up as a kid. You're, you're just laid out flat. You're w- expecting the next hit. And he would wait. He'd wait until your body relaxed, and he'd hit you again. And then he would wait until you relaxed, and he'd hit you again. He did it until you gave up. You literally just gave up your will to to resist, and you just you kind of checked out, and then he would continue to just beat you. And he's the same guy that electrocuted me. He's the same man that dunked me in a tub till I passed out. A lot of horrible things, well, much horrible. But this is what changed my life. I asked the Lord, I said, where were you, Lord? And then I could see that room again so clear. I could see me laying on the bed as a kid. I could see the window, a bathroom, a closet. Saw my stepfather with a beer in hand and a belt wrapped around his hand. And and right before he reared back to hit me the first time, Jesus appeared. And and then Jesus stepped in between him and me. And then Jesus just lowered his body down on mine. And his body kind of sank into mine. And he was taking the hardest part of every part of that beating. And and I remember thinking, who does that? It's a loving God who says he never leaves us nor forsakes us. And he entered into that pain with me. I think to just keep me alive, to keep my brain from completely splitting and never coming back and at that point i remember it going that's really that's a jesus that, that's a god i can trust because he didn't watch and feel pity he actually entered into that and took the beating with me so that was a big change and i would tell folks this it's not god that causes evil to happen to us or injustices he allows men to make decisions, and men are often yielding to evil. But it is God who redeems the worst that people will do. And I'm living proof of that. You are so right. And I, children are the most vulnerable among us, you know, and, and the preborn too, you know, and that's who we advocate for here at Students for Life. I cannot, people who harm children or seek to harm them. There's a special place in hell in them. It should they not meet Jesus. It's, I think so. I, I. It's maddening to the point that I have no words. There was a video. I don't know if you posted or somebody else posted it yesterday. That when it was um, a mother who was trying to drown her child, and you yeah. just how yep. how do you get to the place that you could do this to a child? I mean. I, I'm a mother of three. I understand the frustrations of motherhood right. sometimes. You know, you, you're you too witch and you, maybe you want to pull your hair out, but you walk away. I mean, yeah. I cannot fathom what you have been through and what so many people have been through like you. I mean, the fact that there is such evil in this world is grotesque. And, you know, I hope Jesus comes soon because it, it's bad. But you, now you kind of work, tell us a little bit about the work that you do now. And maybe if... Um, you're okay to share. I know that you've been a part of some actual rescues of people who have been through similar situations and been yeah. trafficked. Can you share us some of that? Yeah, sure. Our organization is called All Things Possible. My wife and I founded it. We're celebrating 20 years. Congratulations. Uh, this year. Thank you. And, you know, I'd say this. Um, uh, we got best known for our work probably these last you know, eight years of of recovering, rescuing, helping traumatized children and women 
who were held captive or affected by ISIS. So that we still actually have a safe house in Iraq, and it's all documented. Um, so uh, there are a lot of people that don't understand the terms sex trafficking or human trafficking or child trafficking or abuse, and, and it's still part of our mission to help educate people. But, um, you know, a lot of evil because of that organization, a lot of sexual abuse, a lot of sex slaves, and we just uh, we just went there to help those who were traumatized. But next thing we knew, we were we were being part of facilitating or you know getting kids or women out of bad areas. And um, again, it's not anything. We get contacted by thousands of people saying, "Hey, I want to be on your team. I want to go." And and it's just something we go, no, no, you don't. You think you do, and you have a, a heart to want to do stuff, but it, it it's a horrible, it's a horrible lifestyle, and you better be called to it. Uh, we have a safe house in you know Cambodia, Southeast Asia. We currently have twenty two girls in there, and it's it's constant recovering or rescuing or facilitating um, medical and health treatments. And then we pursued justice. It took us one year to actually catch a guy, one full year. And we spent about $100,000 between surgeries, trauma care, putting teams together to hunt him down. Um, but it was worth it. And, um, and then here in the U.S., we just started a new fund. It's called the Pedophiles Hunters Fund. Pedophile Hunters Fund. And it's on our website victormarks.com forward slash PHF. And I will tell you, here in America, it's probably worse than anywhere else. And for two reasons. We're a godless nation right now. It, it is a, it's um, the moral compass of America is not even off. It's just broken. And that has allowed poor pastors when I say poor, I mean compromised, weak-willed, passive pastors to get into ministry. And then they really lead people in a bad way. It has allowed us to allow leadership to have authority over us as people that they're debased, they're perverted, they're evil and wicked, and the people suffer. And we can see the state of America where it is right now. Now, I, I'm hopeful I'm usually hopeful, but this this area, the last, the last stage of a country or nation, before it implodes with complete debauchery, is the children. And I've been, my wife and I have been an advocate for the unborn because they are the most vulnerable, out of all the demographic. I can remember, thirty some years ago, standing in front of an abortion clinic in my uniform and black belt saying I'm here to defend and protect unborn children. And uh, we've always been part of that, and we're so grateful for the Supreme Court overturning that. And I would say this, child abuse, child pedophilia, and child trafficking is beyond what anybody in America truly wants to know it's too hard it's 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 so dark and it's so overwhelming most people just they just go just show me a shadow i don't want to know really what's happening but we are working with law enforcement and have for years and anybody that says they don't work directly with law enforcement and they're into some type of counter sex trafficking i just i just wouldn't support them I, I, I wouldn't buy into that. And then there's people who do anti-trafficking, which is only the educational aspect. But there's very few that actually do the, in some capacity, help facilitate the hunting of and protecting of women or children or actually the, the, the offenders, the criminals, the pedophiles themselves. And we're one of them. There's a few others that we trust and know and even partner with 
But I would tell people, be very careful. It's such a catchphrase. Um, and a slick website and someone who can speak well can make you think they're doing great things. But when oftentimes very few do anything. So, again, there's a lot going on. We're, we're focusing right now on the, on the whole transfer through the Internet. The biggest problem is the Internet with child pornography. That is the feeder. That is the monster uh, that feeds all of it. The drag queens that are coming after children, the, the, the perverted community that believes children should see men naked in the street. It's the Internet. It's the child pornography that ruins the mind of lawmakers and it allows them to get caught with stuff and then be blackmailed. That's why they won't pursue justice. Right. Trust me, it, it is happening on a large scale. People know Epstein's Island. They know it, it, it. How come not one perpetrator has been exposed? It's because the CIA was involved and they use all this information for blackmail. So again, I don't want to get off on anything, you know, to get people sideways, but prayer is the most important thing. Finding an organization that's doing the right thing. And if people don't like ours, I can, I can give you a couple of others. Just have them contact me to find out what their passion is. But, uh, I would say this, we live in a day and age where you must protect your children. I would keep kids off the internet at all costs, yeah. at all costs. No child deserves a phone with access to the internet. Uh, and while parents are going, well, I want to be able to reach my kid. That's how the groomers, that's how the pedophiles are going to reach your kid through an app, through a game. They're, they're, and if you think the police are the ones that can help you, you're wrong because they're overwhelmed. They're understaffed. They're underfunded and most of the time under trained. So I could, I could within an hour, pull up and put together 10 cases of porn, child porn that's being transferred. And I can even get you the IP addresses, right? Actionable intel to put together packages and give it to law enforcement. You know what the chances are of law enforcement actually doing something? Very small because they've got a thousand more and they don't have the teams. They don't have this. So that's why we, we operate in a way in conjunction, we can't give away some of our methods, um, but in a way that we believe is most efficient and actually will protect children, but will put bad people in prison. Yeah, you, you say law enforcement has such a stack, and I believe it because it is everywhere. Uh, porn is one of the biggest businesses that exists. And, um, you're right. Kids shouldn't have phones, my, um, or have internet access. Anyway, right. we, I have a 15 year old and, um, he plays football and does sports and stuff. So we do have a phone, but it's a gab phone that has no internet access. Beautiful. You cannot download apps to Great it. Parent. So there right is nothing, there. you know, I mean, he can text his friends and call them and that's pretty much about it. Look at the weather. Uh, How know, do there's... people get that phone? Uh, um, tell- so gab.com, I actually have a discount code for it. If you use discount, uh, Christine, but it's, you could probably reach out to them and work with them yourself. Um, they are a wonderful company. I know Abby Johnson also works with them. She's big in the pro-life movement and, yep. um, it's just a phone that wants to protect children yes. and basically they can't download anything. They also have um, a lot of people like GPS watches and stuff on their yep. kids to be able to know where they yes. are. You can't yeah. download any apps on it. It's a watch. Um, I think it might have, I, I don't, it might have like a built in game or something, but there is no communication with anybody else. You can text your parents, um, but the phone is great. We like it. I mean, you know, my son's like, mom, why can't I have an iPhone? But like everybody else. And I said, well, when you can get a job and you move out and pay for your own iPhone, then you do whatever you want. But while I'm paying for it, this is what we're going to do. Um, Good parenting right there. Well, he might argue with you on that. Well, he will, but it still doesn't change (laughs) the fact. You know, one of our, our youngest child, I remember we got him a phone and I let him know all the dangers. And within like a couple of months, he came in and brought it back. I'll never forget. He brought it back and said, I don't want it anymore. Wow. We're like, what? He goes, that's dangerous. Yeah. I, I don't want it. I said, wow. Okay. 
And he rolled without a phone forever. He graduated. Now he actually works with Charlie Kirk at Turning Point USA. Nice. And, yeah, so I, I, I just, I believe kids don't have necessarily the, the, the understanding. Uh, and, and the enemy is so sneaky through the so Internet. That's, everybody's worried about the van pulling up and snatching a kid. And I'm telling you, you should be worried about that the app on the phone yeah, uh, because that's where predators are moving and grooving. They're out there as well, but they're going to work their way into a child that way. Yeah. There's another organization. I think it's called protect young eyes or something like that. And yep. they kind of tell parents, you know, look out for this. Or, you know, if you have this app for the parents who do have iPhones, if you have this, if you have that, um, this is what you need to be on the lookout for. But I want to get back to you um, and kind of you, what you do, you've quite literally risked your life for uh, numerous times for others, people that you don't even know. And yeah. you said one time, you said, if I'm in the center of God's will, is it my business, how I go home? which I thought was so incredibly beautiful and so telling mm. you're risking your life for these people. What are some of these situations that you've gone into and risked your life? Tell us one of those stories. Well, you know, 16 pumps in Iraq and Syria. Um, and at, at one point we were contacted by the FBI that ISIS was actually now hunting our family <laughs> in Iraq. So we had to hide uh, for three days before we got out of the country. And, and we've been back multiple times since then, but I don't know, you know, we, uh, I remember one time we were rolling toward a village that was ISIS controlled. We had embedded with the Iraqi army, uh, the ninth armored division. And our goal was to let them blow up bad people. Um, and then we would help women and children that might be being held captive. And, um, and I remember one day on that mission, over, I think it was over 30 mortars were fired at our vehicle as we moved toward this village. And we're just taking mortars everywhere. And, you know, it wasn't the first time we, it's happened a lot. But were you I, scared? Um, well, let me explain my wife, and I will <laughs> tell you why I wasn't scared. The first mission I ever did in Iraq, my wife was on the team. And I remember telling her, no, you cannot go. This is, ISIS is everywhere. They will. And she's, we, so we argued pretty good, or we call it fussing in the Cajun vernacular. And, and I remember telling her, why do you want to go? I mean, why? And she just said, honey, you and the team will find the girls. I know you will, because there was 30 girls that we were looking for that had been held captive but were suffering mental health issues, but they were, they were deep in an area, and it, it was very dangerous. She goes, you'll find the girls. And I'm like, you're darn right we will. Me and the boys, we're going to find them, and we'll, we'll kill anybody that stands in our way. But then she said this, you won't be able to hug them, and they need to be hugged. They're so severely traumatized. They were all sex slaves. And I said, wow. I said, you're willing to risk your life to hug a girl or these girls? And she said this. She goes, what's the worst that can happen? We die? And I was like, yes, we die. She goes, but then don't we win, babe? Don't we win? And that's her faith. So that is a woman that when I go on missions that I know is possible for me not to return and the one that I'm telling you about, I remember telling my wife, hey, this, you know. And, and again, this is my wife. I'm like, babe, if I, if I do certain missions to combat zones to help women, yeah, I said, you know, you could be a widow. Are you, are, have you settled this of being a widow for the cause of Christ? Because that's the only reason why we're doing this. We're following God's will. And she goes, I'd rather be a widow and then being known for married to a coward. She said, You go get you go get those kids. So when you say was I afraid? No. I was more afraid of felling my wife's image of me <laughs> as a as a warrior. And uh and I would always go into those hostile environments. 
being shot at or mortared or, you know, whatnot. Uh, V beds blowing up, uh, knowing that my wife was praying for me, that she would be proud of me and my kids would be knowing that I did my best and, and that I would see them in heaven. We all die sometime. I'd rather die in God's will than, than outside of his will live a miserable life. Isn't that the truth? You, I mean, you're fascinating, but your wife sounds just as fascinating and she incredible. Is. She's and my I don't, hero. I don't like to use bad words, but you both sound completely badass. If oh. I just, you know, <laughs> might say so myself. She's a baddie um, for sure. Yeah. So the people, uh, I want to kind of just read something for those who are listening and try to like get them to understand the magnitude of trafficking as a whole. The 2017 U.S. Trafficking in Persons report says uh, sex trafficking victims are exposed to pelvic inflammatory disease, HIV, AIDS, and other sexually transmitted infections. Human traffickers may force pregnant victims to undergo abortions, usually in unsafe conditions, posing uh, further trauma and health risks. Do you see the connection between abortion and sex trafficking and uh, hum- yeah. uh, human trafficking? I know there's uh, yeah, yeah. primarily like the sex trafficking is yeah, the biggest, a- a- abs- biggest. Absolutely. It is a form of birth control um, because, I mean, uh, a, a girl or a woman, you know, could have sex 20 times a day. She could run 20 men in a day. And, um, You know, a a pregnancy is nothing more than an inconvenience that's got to be dealt with. And some places will choose to allow a woman to stay pregnant uh, in order to um, sell her for sex for men with fetishes of having sex with a pregnant woman. Disgusting. And then there are places and countries where they will allow the baby to be born in order to harvest uh, either the child's organs uh, or raise an unnamed, unknown child uh, to be used for sex as a from an infant on. So th- it's a very dark world, um, and and I, I I pray that people would understand that evil is manifested, um, and that's why when people say, "Oh, I want to help you." I just go, no, you don't. You think you do. You you don't know the level of darkness that we encounter. And, um, but you can pray for us and you can support us and pray for us like you're there with us. You know, uh, there was a, one of the last missions that I went on out of country because we're doing a lot here, but out of country, we, we, we got the intel that a girl was raped. 14 years old, I believe, uh, raped and stabbed. She was stabbed in her neck, face, back. It was unbelievable. And the team did the recovery and saved her life. And I actually posted a video on Instagram because I knew people wouldn't, couldn't believe this. And I'll, I'll make sure you get the link. So she did the rescue and then they prayed for her, and then we put her in our safe house after her stay in a little clinic, and I got her from the clinic to, with the team to our safe house, and it was how she survived. When you see the video, it's unbelievable because she's literally sitting on the stoop of her little house, bleeding out, and she's just pale, blood everywhere. And um, within 72 hours, me and one other fellow, Chaz, on our team, he confirmed the guy had been captured and confirmed that he was going to be prosecuted, met with the police, and um, he he was just a little demon-filled monster. And it's guys like the, him that, believe me, I'm okay praying for. I'm, I'm happy to pray for them and then yeah. watch them reap the consequences of their sin and action, which I believe penalties should be as, as harsh as the crime. And um, and that can be done in other countries. I mean, I, 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 you know, so, but I'm glad that Governor DeSantis here in the U.S. signed in the law that if an adult rapes a child, they will receive the death penalty. I, I think that's a fair and appropriate, uh, just 
um, consequence. It was Jesus himself that said, it's better, it is better for a man to have a millstone tied around his neck and dropped into the deepest part of the ocean. And that was alive. He would be dropped alive um, uh, to both drown and be eaten, uh, you know. And I, I think that without consequences, pedophiles fear nothing. And as a matter of fact, evil's in an uptick. And, um, yeah, it, it's, um, I thank God for people like you and you guys who are willing to stand in the gap to protect unborn babies because, again, they're the most vulnerable. And when a society feels justified, well, you know, we're living in Colorado, all right, we're based here in the Springs. You have a training center. And, Me too. Oh, well, yeah. I'm in I'm in Parker area, but okay. not too far from you. So, uh, it, it, it doesn't it blow your mind that we have one of the most godless governors, and and where have the Christians been to allow full term abortions? Yep. I, I, I and then we're now we're an abortion sanctuary state. Uh, I tell people. God, God will allow consequences for people's action. If you want an evil king, he'll allow it. But then you're going to read the consequences of it. Um, and I, I fear for Colorado as a state. And unless the people rise up and put better people in leadership, change some of these godless laws, bad things are going to continue to happen here. You're right. It, it's atrocious what's happening here in Colorado. I mean, all over the country and even the world, the way that we dehumanize the pre-born for convenience, well, for profit, yeah. for big abortion business, yep. you know, if it's profit for them. But for the rest of us, you know, we're told that, you know, a baby is an inconvenience and motherhood isn't something to be um, treasured. And, you know, we need to be able to climb the corporate ladder and be just like men. And we have to kill our babies to get there. And it's, uh, it's gotten to a place where sometimes I just think, how, how did we get here? But the fact that abortion is what helps fuel sex trafficking is something I want people to really think about. I mean, it even, I would go so far as to say, you know, abortion even fuels pornography because, you know, there are women who get pre oh, pregnant, sure. there are women who are raped in porn and, yep. you know, the abortion is what's making it easier. Um, I want to read a couple of other things. Uh, we're seeing an increase in the abortion pill use, uh, especially by male. And this has dangerously removed the ability for a victim to talk to someone face to face. Uh, and somebody who should be a mandated reporter. You know, if you go into a medical clinic, one 2014 study of sex trafficking survivors indicated that 88% had reported contact with the healthcare provider, 30% um, with Planned Parenthood, and 19% with women's health clinics. I don't trust Planned Parenthood, obviously. Right. They've, they've yep. covered this stuff up. Um, but in looking at areas of sex trafficking and abortion, the study highlighted that 67 women... 55% um, had at least one abortion, 30% 30 had, 30 had multiple abortions, totaling 114 coerced abortions from sex trafficking, and 55% reported miscarriages likely from the abuse and trauma that they go through. Their body just can't sustain it. Um, and obviously, sex, or excuse me, Planned Parenthood is supposed to report sex trafficking and abuse, but we have undercover videos of showing that they don't. And so they they're don't. not quite the beacon of hope that you know, maybe another medical doctor might be. But do you see the rise of the abortion pill, especially by male, emboldening sex traffickers? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have a strong outreach in Las Vegas, one of the, you know, the capital of sex trafficking and prostitution, and it is just a natural product where uh, you know an unborn, an unwanted baby is nothing uh, but a detriment to the money that needs to be made from using a woman again and again. So, yeah, we, we, we work it all backwards. I, I, I recently, we bring survivors uh, of trafficking here to our training center, and we do, we do specialized training for them, right? So we'll teach them about jujitsu, blade work, shooting, um, empowerment tools. Then we do prayers for them and, uh, team building. It's it's pretty amazing therapy, uh, but they'll come from all over the country. We fly them in. We pay for everything. And this is all here in the spring or in the yep. spring. I yeah, and here, I invite you to come out, out maybe in October. I'd love to check it out. Yeah, you come in and see. 
Uh, they're called Samantha Weekends. And uh, so Samantha's our director over, you know, outreach in that realm. But uh, it, it's, it's amazing to see the truth. And I recently did a podcast here in the studio uh, show with them. And I asked these trafficked women, how do you get women out and girls out of this? And you, you know their number one answer wasn't prosecution of traffickers. It was actually help them heal from their childhood drama. Help wow. them heal from the root that makes them vulnerable to get turned into this. Of course, the next thing was life skills, a job, give them a way out. And we're seeing it and we're doing it. <laughs> but I said, how do you keep girls from being trafficked? You know what they said? Every one of them, keep the family strong. Keep the family unit strong. Because I, probably one of the worst quotes I've ever heard in my life was from a pimp. And he said, I want to thank the fathers and the uncles for making our job easy. And that includes stepdads. Uh, of childhood abuse of girls, and even guys, can lead to that. Um, you know, I have incidents side to that uh, and, and God's given us a, a great love for people in the sex industry um, but so much of it I asked a question on social media last night I said what do you think what do you think happens more uh, uh, children being trafficked sex trafficked or children just being abused sexually at home and a lot of people said both and I'm like no it's not both there's far more child abuse and sexual abuse at home in every neighborhood, in every city, than there are children being trafficked. Traffic just is is something that people are being made aware of, and and we should fight it. And, but you again, start with the home. Yeah. You know, protect children, go after the child porn images, and there's no doubt the increase of prostitution and trafficking is a direct result and is part of the porn industry. You know, Joshua uh, Broom is a fellow who was one of the top actors in the porn industry for years. And he's actually someone that I've mentored and was talking to him this morning. And uh, he, he, he just explains the reality of what porn is not. And it's it's all it's all just synthetic, make believe. None of it's real. It's all yeah. buy in. But that's what fuels guys to want to now go buy women. And what many trust me, the the fastest growing number of offenders with child porn are young men in their late teens mm -hmm. and twenties. It's not just the old guys anymore. Young men because they're being introduced to porn at 8, 9, 10 years old. They spend all their teenage years addicted, ruined, and now they're in their 20s, and it just spirals downward. So I would say dads and families who want to see a difference, make sure you protect your home best you can. That's, that's where the real battle starts. Absolutely. Our young people, you know, a lot of times we have uh, electric devices or electronic devices, babysitter kids. And, you know, it's in part because we've taken the woman out of the home and, you know, government yeah. is now benefiting from her working not only in taxes, but now they get to raise the kids and then kids are put on electronics. And we don't always know what's going in our children's eyes and ears, even games and uh, oh. apps and all that, like we were talking about earlier. Um, it's, it's devastating. We have to keep the family strong. We have to protect or d explain this stuff to our kids. Really, you know, like yeah. tell them this is why pornography is wrong. Do it before somebody else does, because if somebody else gets to your kid first, now I'm not advocating you talk to a five-year-old about it necessarily, but right. um, should you be protecting them? You shouldn't have to talk about a five-year-old, but when they get a little bit older, they're going to hear about it from the kids at school or from somebody else. And so oh, yeah. you want to have that conversation first and tell them, you know, should you ever see this or should everybody, anybody ever show this to you? Tell them, first of all, actually, I saw something. It said, you know, if somebody wants to show you something on the phone, say, what is it? 
first. Yep. And then if, you know, if it's something innocent, you can look at something innocent, but then if it's something that you don't want to see, say, I don't want to see it. Or once you see it, go tell your parents, if it makes you feel uncomfortable, talk to them and have that open yep. relationship with your kids so that they can come to you and they can talk to you about something like that. Um, I want to go back a little bit to the, um, a couple of things I, I did so much research and I was like, I am like just <laughs> mind boggled at this. And I could probably literally could talk to you for 10 hours. I'm not kidding. Probably more. Um, I, yeah, and I know got that less than 10 minutes. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you're, it, it's all fine. I, I want people to understand how corrupt the abortion industry is obviously. And that's why we have you on. And in a study called the Beasley study, one survivor said, this is a sex trafficking survivor said, I got pregnant six times yep. and had six abortions during this time. Yes. Several of them were from a doctor who yeah. was a client. Yep. The doctor was the client of this woman. He go. did them back door. At least one of my abortions was from Planned Parenthood because they didn't ask any questions. Are you aware of instances like this? Or have you come across pregnant women who've had to deal with things like this? Yeah, absolutely. It's that's why I say, you know, this dark side of the sex industry and trafficking, uh, it's far worse than people imagine. And, I remember, like even overseas, you know, having my bubble popped when here we are helping these girls who've been held captive. Here we are facilitating rescues. We're involved in just life and death stuff. And I remember talking to a gal who really had the insight of what was going on. And this was early on. And I said, hey, if we can get the girls from this location to here in this city we're in, we can provide some, uh, I'll put out security teams and safety and da, da 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 And I remember she looked at me and said, one of the most respected doctors in this town is part of ISIS. They bring the new girls kidnapped to him for medical treatment. And if any of them get pregnant, they'll do the abortions and or, or other things and i thought oh my gosh and here in the u.s there are people that are dirty in every sphere from politicians to judges to law enforcement to police uh and and ministers you know but what i would tell people in every one of those realms there are good people fighting the good fight you just gotta have discernment of the good ones and the bad ones but yeah, it's um, again. If you're in the sex industry, pregnancy is is part of it, and the abortion is part of the solution to stopping people from making money. Uh, uh, so yeah, it happens plenty. Yeah, it's so repulsive. Um, human trafficking is a hundred and fifty dollar per year industry. Uh, sex trafficking rakes in ninety nine billion dollars. It's yep. It's big money, and it's something that we need to be paying attention to, and it sounds like our government is not doing enough to stop it, which is so incredibly unfortunate. Um, Victor, I think you are in the running, if not the top candidate, for most interesting man in the world. So I thank you for joining us, and I do hope to get down there to the Springs and check out what you guys do a little bit more. I think it's awesome what you're doing. Um, but I, you. I end every episode with one question. If you could encourage those to speak out um, about sex trafficking or spe specifically about, um, you know, the pre-born and fighting for the pre-born, because sometimes it's tough to talk about the hard things, you know, what, yeah. what one piece of advice would you give them to speak out? Are they worth it? There you I, have. I, I, I yeah. think if a person settles in their soul, if unborn children, are, are they worth speaking out for? And when you settle it, then you won't have a feeling of uncomfortableness in the moment of what I would call engagement. So you don't have to worry about answering all the questions or, or doing everything right, but just you've settled in your soul that unborn children are worth it. Yeah. They're worth saving. Are they worth it? That is powerful. You guys, I want everybody to go check out the work that he does. It's at victormarks.com. All Things Possible is uh, the organization that he and his wife have. Victor, thank you so much for sharing a little bit of your time with us today. I am, 
I mean, I just want to hear more about the, everything that you and your wife are doing. You guys are complete rock stars. <laughs> well, it's been great to be on the program with you. Thanks for the invite. And you're, you have a standing invitation. Come down here. We'll do some awesome. shooting, blade work, and uh, have coffee. And you'll be able to meet some of the uh, survivors of trafficking. And you'll be blessed. That would it. be incredible. That would be incredible. Thank you so much, Victor. You're welcome. God bless you.